I'll, 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 I'll let you drive. Do you? <laughs> it's nice of you. We're recording, by the way. Stefan Hull, absolute fucking pleasure to have you in the studio. Thanks very much. Are you, hang on. Yeah, I've got to remember to switch cameras. Are you, uh, are you... Oh, no. One second. One second. Bit more. Should we start again? I nearly used the M word then. Let's definitely the... start again. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're on, no, we're on. no, it's not. We're on. Um, I was going to say to you, I was gonna, I knew, like I said, I knew you'd turn up the list. I knew. I think I, I think I said it to Kate. I said, no, do you know what? No, I, di- I didn't. I thought about it. I, am I opening? I, I even rehearsed the opening, the way I would open the podcast, but you've put off, you've, you've dissuaded me from doing it now because you talk, you talk with your list, you put me completely off a stride and the opening was going to be, Stefan, you seem like a man who's got a lot to talk about. And I... <laughs> <laughs> um, mate, Mega, uh, in general, how's life? How has the, how has... Mate, how have, you, how have you found the pandemic? What's it as a personal experience for you? For me, it's mostly been work from home, and then that's been really, really busy with work and like work commitments. And then I've also hardly taken any time off, and any time that I have taken off, we've then done work with React. And then, yeah, just a busy year, really busy year, sort of, and probably un- slightly unhealthily busy. Right, okay. Yeah, so are you one of those people who, who fills all your time with other projects? I mean, I know you listened to the Mandy Small podcast recently, recently, and we've talked about it there. Are you one of those people? Are you like me and Mandy? Just keep myself busy. Yeah, probably. Yeah, like crazy busy though. <laughs> yeah. I think I find it really hard to just relax. So actually, I did, take a, I did go to take a week off earlier in the year and uh, went down to Cornwall thought, right, I'm going to actually just relax for a change. I, f- I came over really, really tired. I was like, oh, what's that? Yeah, maybe this because I've actually switched off and I can, you know, unsettle your hormones. And you, you know, you can be susceptible to getting ill. Anyway, it turned out I had COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? I was, I was like, oh, this, this is obviously because I've, because I've finally switched off. It's like, no, no, I've just picked up the virus and just went man down. <laughs> I was all right, um, but just really, really lethargic. And uh, yeah. Well, Ma- Ma- Man- Mandy, Mandy got. L- I'd never heard of long COVID and short COVID until last week. Another one of these little poets. Have you heard? Yeah, yeah. I'd never heard of it. Mandy had COVID for three months. Do you, are you aware of that? I know you're in the, the Patreon group with yeah. her, right? But she has been off work for three months, mate. She caught COVID and she has been destroyed the whole time. She literally went back to work last week or the week before. Mental, like crippled, crippled her. Yeah, I know it affects your cognitive ability as well quite a bit. As well as, you know, you, you know, respiratory and other, other components, but I'm no, no doctor by any standards. You got, you got the glasses for doctor. You got to look. Got to look, look I did buy some little round ones back along. <laughs> <laughs> little, thir- I think they were thirty millimeters. They just are completely ridiculous. <laughs> I'd send them back. <laughs> right before we were, t- we were right. talking about stuff before the podcast, yeah. and uh, you mentioned political circles, and you were about to explain it to me. I said, "Start, let's start recording." And the reason I asked, what you mean? So I, the reason I want to talk about that is because I don't know what you're talking about. When you would, when you, we were talking about right and the left being very similar, yeah, yeah, and then you mentioned political circles. So I think a lot of people, you know, they talk about the the linear um, left and right, but if you you know if you bring that almost to a full circle, at the, at the bottom you've then got. Um, more centralists and you know the ability to be able to look at what is going on with the left and right and try and understand that as you go further up the circle or you know on, on the right you've got the right on the left the, you've got the left of the circle and then as you go further up you've got the more extreme views and they actually become closer together so although they, they might you know one might be more um, extreme left one might be ex- more extreme right the behaviors are actually quite similar they're just saying or cl- saying or cl- clinging on to their different arguments but they're very similar in the the way that they're behaving. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And ju- it just dawned on me that um, he, what what about how interesting is the things to study at the moment? Uh, the way uh, society is and the the, the, the perceived extreme um, division, which I don't, I'm not actually sure that that is actually in existence in real life as bad as what's being made out in the media or what we think from social media. The extreme div- uh, uh, division between left and right. Um, Politically flipping, whatever. Um, but from a now, I know you're interested in and you study clinical psychology. No, I just no? started started studying psychology. Okay, ten down the line. 
Okay. But just started. So I wasn't sure you were happy with that. But yeah, so you have an interest in it. You've got more yeah. knowledge than me. Is are the times now, uh, is it interesting to look at from that perspective, from a psychological perspective? I think that's probably more of a hobby for me at the moment, but not a studying level of that level. Just got to stick to my curriculum, move on. Um, but what you were saying about the the way that people perceive it, I think, is you know the information of behaviours. I think it you've got a lot of false balance. I think within terms of social media, so where you've got a little snippet of what's been going on, whether it's you know certain protests, certain behaviours of people, you know, breaking lockdown rules, and you know just really focusing on that. And then because people are looking at their phones and reading all the information on that, and they're not out and about having those conversations with other people, you know, because of lockdown, most people are just picking up all the information on their phone. I think it's very easy to get a false balance of what's really going on. So you would think, you know, if you look at it as a pie chart, you would think, or re in reality, you've got over 99% of people probably doing, you know, something very similar, so social distancing, um, self-isolating, and just behaving to the normal rules and then you've got that one percent where you've got all that focus on there but of those poor behavior poor behaviors those other behaviors and then the way that you perceive it because you're looking at your phone it's you almost look at that pie chart it's 50 50 you think Fuck, you know, everyone's off doing this and you know everyone's breaking the rules and all these different aspects and it's like it's probably not really the case it's just the way that we're perceiving it and that false balance well, yeah, apart from the Rangers fans yesterday. Did you see that? No. Uh, did you not? Oh, my God, mate. Well, we won't, we won't go, well, I, yeah. They, they just, they, they, their celebrations, because they won the match, and just hun thousands, actually, not just thousands of fans and stuff out, out just, just, just not giving it, not giving a damn. Very annoying. Anyway, we won't, we won't go into that. Uh, no, I, 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 yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, and I think <clears throat> it did concern me. I think last it did start to concern me last year. It's like, like flipping heck. Are we? Are, where? Where is the UK headed? Where's the world headed? Or the, the sort of developed world headed? Because the states are the same thing. They seem to have massive issues. Well, they have got massive issues with it. It seems like it. You know, and there's been prominent people saying they're on the verge of a civil war and stuff like that. It might be a bit extreme, but in some areas, some states, they ain't been far off it. But. You know, it did start to concern me last year. It's like, flip, are we headed like the same way? Just people hating each other. But then you, you look, but then I realised that again, going back to that point, is it seems hideous on social media, and in, and in, in like the mainstream media outlets. But in reality, it isn't. You know, I saw someone it was on Twitter and someone tweeted yesterday something about blah 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 Tory scum. You know, and just that blanket and and, and people do it with Labour as well. Labour scum. The blanket, blanket. Blanket, like sweeping statement about everyone who's a who supports who's conservative or support or isn't Labour is like Tory scum. Yeah, and I thought that person who's tweeted that, right? Do they realise that probably half of the people they engage with every day are have that have that hashtag assigned to them? That you just done. They're all decent people. It's like you wouldn't, you know. It's and that, that gives me hope. It's like you know, it's people as when people start acting in the street like they do on social media, acting, interacting in real life like they do on social media, then we got dramas. People will call it out though if they've seen those behaviours in real life. I think a lot of people will call it out and be like, "Oh, what are you doing?" But people go online and they think it's okay to behave like that, which it clearly isn't. Mm. Should we pull this back on track? Should we pull this podcast back to like a... Should we get away from the, the dodgy stuff? <laughs> Polar, polarization of people. You're either with us or against us. Uh, yeah. sort of Everyone's an equal moron and everyone believes different stuff. We're all morons. It's just Maybe we'll come back onto this later on. Who, who knows where this conversation's going to go? <laughs> um, tanky. So you, you, you're a tanky. You... I didn't realize how much younger that beard made me look older. So you 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 joined up nine no two thousand eight. So two thousand eight back, back in two thousand eight. Yes, yeah, turned up to unit two thousand. Yeah, eight. So I I joined two thousand. Uh, tanky. So do you do you know Bags James Cameron? Yeah. yeah. So it was through through Bags that I found out all through Bags that I found out about React, and then through React I found out about um, HR. There you go. Full circle. Mm hmm. Amazing. Tanky, would you go back and join the same regiment, RTR, if you had the choice? Probably not. I enjoyed my time as a, in RTR, but I think looking back, what I wanted from the job wasn't what it 
was when I joined up. So when I was, because it was on tanks. And so I trained as a, me- trained as a mechanic before joining the army. So I had that interest in engineering mechanical things, but wanted to be a combat soldier at the same time. So it was like, right, ah, this, this makes logical sense, especially when you're in the careers office and you, you don't really know what the reality of the jobs are. Um, and then by the time that I joined, or, you know, we were already 2009 by the time I turned up to unit. And then, so the first tour that I, or the only tour that I went out on was Herrick 13, which was not on heavy armor. So it wouldn't have really made that much difference. But, yeah, I think joining up, I, I was after that more kinetic route anyway. Why is that? Have you got military family? Yeah, but not because of that reason. Like my old man never wanted me to join the military. He was a bandsman anyway. So he, he wanted me, I think he wanted me to join the RAF. And I was like, nah, <laughs> I want to go off and do my own thing. Um, you know, you've got, everyone's got that bit of independence and wants to go off and do their own thing. Um, and then, yeah, so... Yeah, joined RTR, enjoyed it. I was glad that I was in RTR. But looking back, would I have done things differently? Yeah, probably. But do I regret it? No. Interesting you mentioned gr- regret, because I didn't ask that question, Stefan. Let's get deep in psychology. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> no. But you, uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. I. <clears throat> It's interesting that it's, uh, just to hear different perspectives on it, especially jo- joining later on. And you join, you decided to join up at a time when it was blatantly obvious um, how how dangerous the situation was. Because uh, not when you joined up, Iraq was still going on, yep. which was, a do- depending on where you went, was proper dodgy um, still. As he equally as dodgy as Afghan. I mean, this is one of the things that gets forgotten, I think. And I'm glad I spoke to some people who, who did a lot of time out there, not a lot, not so much in Afghan. So like it makes you remember, hang on, Afghanistan wasn't the only dodgy, risky tour that was going on at the time. It just got all the press, you know. Well, I think that's quite. I think it's interesting in the aspect that looking back, I had a. I think when I first joined, or I don't know, VW night, uh, VW Beetle, and then before I left, I why didn't, am I, why am I not surprised? <laughs> why am I not didn't surprised? on the road at the time, but um, before I left, I signed it over to my brother, and you know, I didn't have any dependencies. And like you say, there was no, there was no um, false pretenses that, you know, you're going to join up and you're going to be on AT and live in the dream. It's like, you look at the news, people are dying every day. Well, not every day, but once a week, you, there'd be a fatality. So there was, it was very obvious what was going to be happening. And I remember being in the squadron office, I'm on the Sergeant Majors turning around going, joining up for you younger lads, all the troopers, is very different to when I joined up because you know, you know that you're going to go out to conflict where then there wasn't as much going on. Um, different different challenges, but... Let's pull, yeah. let's pull that mic in closer for me. And um, I remember, like, psycho- yeah, psychologically, I was more prepared. Or I... I was aware of the risks and what was the potential outcomes as well. And I remember um, just before just before going out on tour, some overhearing um, some of the officers within talking about, I think it was one of the other units we were on next size with, and they just turned around and said, I think one in four, one in four or one in five of you <coughs> will probably not come back. And, it, and the, the, this is where the officers were having this conversation going, what? what the fuck? <laughs> That's not a good thing to say to your, to your troops. Um, and there was a bit of a, I won't say debate, but a conversation about that between them. And, um, but yeah, I think looking back at that time, going into Herrick, yeah, I, I was aware that there's going to be lots of fighting. Um, and that's sort of what I was expecting, which I think that brings it, quite interesting because I remember doing you know when you final exercises at Stanta and um, having an exercise where um, I think you know we're in a little contact or whatever you know pretend contact and then you're running along and the DS went right okay he's now injured this, this person and they had a real life amputee 
um, you know, with a little bit of claret coming out of his leg and everything else. It's like, right, you know, switch on and deal with this. And then you move on, you know, you do the exercise. Um, and he didn't really think that much of it at the time. But then looking back at it in reflection, and then the first time that I did see somebody, and it was an A and A person um, who was who was injured um, with like severe leg injuries. It was a very similar in the, in an aspect, although it was obviously real. But I didn't have any emotional connection to that. So I think that preparedness of of doing that exercise would have definitely helped with a little bit of gradual exposure, although it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been something that I was aware of at that time. So when I dealt with it in real time, it wasn't as much of a shock, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. I give a talk to, um, <clears throat> I give a talk to uh, Cambridge uh, UOTC um, on Friday about mental resilience. <clears throat> and I use exactly what you said there. I use that as an example of... of of the reasons that people struggle mentally, like what, why, you know, why do you like? I know you, we'll come on to it. You've had, you know, you've experienced um, poor, really poor mental health, and wh why do we, why are we unable to cope with that? Why aren't we very resilient coping with um, whatever causes the, the, the symptoms of mental health? Why aren't we able to deal with that um, when we can? when we can deal with crazy adverse situations and not react adversely. So you, you could take take 10 average civvies, take them off the street, and you put them into the, a contact. Pick them up, hypothetically drop them straight yeah. into a contact. Most of those, if not all of them, are going to have an extreme adverse reaction. Extreme emotional reaction. You know, fight or, f uh, fight, flight or freeze, freeze, fight or flight, whatever the flipping yeah. three things are. Um, you may get one who's just like a, a ninja warrior, you know. Um, but most of them are not, and then you get the military. And the obvious, the obvious answer is, oh, why, why do, why do most military not have that adverse reaction? I said, well, because we we have knowledge, we, we have the knowledge, and the understanding of what we're probably going to be exposed to, what's going to, how that's going to impact us, and what tools we've got to deal with the situation. Go on. I guess yeah. So I think there's two two really good points there. But one I think is the, the gradual exposure. So even when you turn up to training, you know, um, if it's like. Uh, and you're learning drills, brace up, and you're learning those automatic commands, and then you build on that, and at that very basic level, and then you build that, up, you know, it's all incremental gains, because there's nothing special about somebody who is in the military. It's, you know, when they join up, you know, taking that person from being a civilian to a military person, there's nothing different genetically, it's just that exposure around that. So it's all those little incremental gains. So where you've got like that, that um, brace up, you know, it's learning to that automatic action. And then, um, you know, contact front, um, all, the, all the different components and then slowly, you know, gradually build. So when you do hear the word contacts, you're not suddenly, oh my God, what, what's happening? Or, you know, it's you know, straight into it. And then, especially after the first, first time you've been in a contact, you're like, right, okay. Because I remember the very first contact I got in and it was probably less than a second of right it, i'm in the game um much less than a second as well um but then taking it back to the um because there's another point you said there as well in the end uh i was talking about um dealing with mental Ill health i was talking about uh training knowledge resources tools understanding what you've got to deal with it you got, you've forgotten i've forgotten yeah oh, it's, no, it's all right if that cable's getting your way just put it behind your back are we sure? That's it, yeah. Uh, um, got it? Yeah. Um, sorry, the, the point, <coughs> sorry, yeah, the point I was, I was making with that, the, that obvious statement of, you know, well, we are good at, we, we don't have adverse reactions because we've gone through training and we understand what, what, what the situation is and we understand how we can react and what's going to go on around us. Like, and, you know, in whatever way that, that happens. Uh, Whereas with the mental health, we don't. Like I didn't when my when when I started experiencing mental ill health. One, I didn't understand it. Two, I didn't even recognise it. And three, I didn't know what I could do to overcome it. So it it took me years of years of trying to understand it while I'm while I was going down the pan to get to the point where 
right now i understand it and now i've got tools and resources but that was sort of a very late point i was able to you know get back out of it so, the, so where i am now if you analogize it back to um well i would analogize it back to the military thing so when i go into a i would like you're saying you go into a contact you those bullets whiz over your head or you initiate the contact you initiate the contact you know straight away what you're doing you know exactly what's going on there's no flapping there's no adverse reaction you know exactly what you need to do and that's the state i am now with my mental health is that when when a when a situation arises like i i get a little bit stressed or i get anxiety to a level i notice it then straight away i know what i need to do <laughs> there's not months and years of it I'll be just carrying on and getting worse and worse and worse straight away. I know what I need to do. And you know, and that for me, knowing what I need to do is go, okay, recognize okay, why why am I anxious? Let's try and fix that problem. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, you know, and it's a, it's like the IA drill for mental health, right? Okay. Why are you feeling like that? Try and identify the problem. If you can't identify the problem, take some other actions to try and make yourself feel a bit better and see if that fixes it. And if not, go to the next stage of the IA drill. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's an easy lesson to learn either. <laughs> no. It's very, well, it's no, very difficult the thing because though, you're going to read a book. I think you can read a book on it and go, oh yeah, happy days. But actually knowing how to do it and implementing yeah, it and can, learning those but you can, feelings. But you can. The, the, you absolutely can. And it's knowledge, right? And, and yeah. so, and this is what I like about the whole mental health conversation. I think it's moving away from. It only gets so. It it was a case for the last few years where mental health, that term, and anything to do with well-being and mindfulness was only coming up within the military spectrum, right? When you were talking about mental ill health, okay, yeah, right, and that is slowly changing because in reality, when you talk about mental health, you just, same when you talk about physical health, all this stuff you've got, all these tools you can. can just to improve yourself you don't have to be in a bad place to to use these things you can just be to improve to improve yourself and be more be more aware of things now where the knowledge and understanding and tools and resources comes in is very much earlier on in the military career yeah so straight like depot you're getting taught about mental health you're getting taught about mindfulness and well-being so straight very early on that gradual exposure like you mentioned to people are being gradually exposed to the stuff they need that they can use if they want to help improve themselves, but if they have an adverse reaction, if they exp- go on, I think going to do something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if they have uh, some form of like serious mental Ill health, they they able to identify it earlier on. They they've already got an understanding of what they need to do to try and fix things. I think yeah, and I think it's really good because you know being being able to identify that first of all is huge, and then you've got the other component of not having to sit with that and then have that shame around you know if you are struggling with your mental health it's other people around you are, get, are going to be aware of that subject so it makes it easier to have that conversation or easier for your peers or oppos to then go mate is everything right can you hear your beard rather than the microphone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah yeah yeah, yeah anyone yeah. listen to this headphones <laughs> yeah go on so um so, where do you want, do you want to, where do you want to jump to? You you had a you've got a list of you, I know there's a bunch of points you want to come on to. Where do you, where do you want to jump to? You t- like what? You, I mean, yeah. Go on. So, um, well, it wasn't so much of a it was just a bit of a, yeah, just a bit of a chronological chronological order about my story. So, um, yeah, sort of touched on um, trains of mechanic, then joined uh, RTR, um, did Herrick thirteen. Um, Enjoyed? Yeah, I think so. It's an interesting word, I think, to use for a tour, but yeah, I think there's loads of emotions that go with the tour. or lo- loads of, you, c- you could look at different bits and bobs of that, but I definitely didn't come back and you know, resent any of my time um, in the military. Um, and then wanted to go on to um, other aspects of my career um, within the military. And then Herrick 18 was coming up. And by this point, after coming back from... Herrick 13 I went to Australia and uh, I sort of seen a different different <coughs> options of life and uh, I was like right you know this could be mega I'll come out here I'll work in the iron ore mines I'll earn loads of money I'll set up my own skydiving business I'll retire with a you know massive house as you can tell that's going really really well <laughs> and then um, um, so and then decided right I'll, I'll do Herrick 18 and I'll get out and then 
I was told that we were going to be doing like more of a ground holding uh, role, and I wanted to do part of the BR or make up a part of the BRF um, due to the, you know, the internal politics, I guess, of what was happening with the turn to the different units and it becoming the end of the um, the end of Herrick as it was um, before it moved on. Um, BRF wasn't on the cards, and I was, I didn't think that I was going to get out what I wanted from that tour, so I decided to jump ship, and then um, I thought it would make transition a bit easier. Um, getting out a little bit younger younger age opposed to then getting out conscious of my beard are oh, you fine um conscious of uh oh, i gained some mic um so then then i got out um i had three different career career options neither of them quite worked out initially so i was um did a bit of door work and then driving trucks and then i was uh I was approached by the, or the, the guy who ran the door company, turned around and said, you know, do you want to do six nights, a, six, six nights a week on the door? I thought, yeah, that'd be gleaming. You know, I'll be able to get a job interview and then fly off. You know, I won't do this for any more than two months. Yeah, so like, best part of it, almost a year later, um, <laughs> an a- actual career comes through. I'd like little, I was never unemployed, but always just, just sort of scraping by. And then I ended up getting into a bit of financial hardship at that time as well. Um, and then that was that was quite difficult. So that's, I think that's like one of the little pins of where things started to go wrong as well, because you had that, that financial overhang, which then was really difficult to then build up on. So then, um, started a new career in the telecoms and then, you know, that progressed on. Now I was at the point where I was, you know, more, more of an established person, uh, within that career, I would be able to do more and more overtime. But as I was starting to become, or well, having more self-destructive behaviors and a lot of it through drinking that I would then do more overtime to try and get out of debt. But then because I was probably working so much and I was then being more self-destructive that I'd just end up drinking more and then blow my money anyway. So it was, you know, very, um, very destructive circle. Um, and then that's when I, and like I said, there was quite a lot of destructive behaviours there. Um, and then s- something happened. Oh, there's an altercation, and I thought, you know, this isn't this isn't right here. You know, the way that I reacted. I was uh, there's one point where I was just not out of control, but took it a little bit too far. Too far. It's yeah. an altercation at work. No, no, no. Uh, out drinking. Um, s- something else kicked off. Yep. Got sort of dragged into it. Not, not ideal. And then I thought, you know, on reflection, I was like, you know, that that wasn't okay. The way that that happened. Um, and then I thought, it went right, okay. You know, a few people have sort of said about my mental health, but I need to, you know, I need to address this now. Um, and that was a really difficult battle, anyway. Um, like within terms of me being able to actually just put my hand up and go, you know, I'm not doing so great here. Um, just for many different reasons. Um, and a lot of it I think was shame of I'm, why I'm not, why am I unwell? Like, I haven't done anything that's caused me to be unwell. Like, I haven't lost any limbs. I haven't, you know, um, none of my mates got injured. Um, like mates I was really close with. Um, so you know, oh, it can't be anything, you know, move on, you know, um, which wasn't particularly useful to myself because it was just suppressing, <coughs> suppressing that um, shame, essentially, around you, that poor mental health, then, then go on. Do you think that's a, uh, do you think that's a, a big blocker for a lot of people who they who maybe have they've not had they don't think they've experienced some some like crazy traumatic event or events you know, like you mentioned you know you didn't lose any friends for example and that is potentially a blocker to them feeling that they have they uh what's the word that they're entitled to pipe up and go i need some help like for that shame piece i think i've never really, thought of that before i think they're really understandable and quite a few other people have said you know i can't be that Okay, it can't, it can't, you'll be fine, you know, it can't, it can't be PTSD, it can't be this, or, and I don't think anything's as simple as that, and, you know, we'll come on, come on to diagnosis and labels later on, but, um, yeah, I don't think it's as simple as that, anyway, so I, I spoke to um, Combat Stress at the time, and um, 
that that was quite a I think when you put that quite vulnerable position um, and or you're exposing yourself vulnerable vulnerably to to a bit of help and then you've got to go through all these different barriers of you know call, you know um, have a consultate phone consultation have two or three of those then eventually you'll see somebody and then I s spoke to somebody and um, they were asking how um, you know a little bit about me so how was how was uh, your childhood yeah it was fine um, you know I get a whack if I was um, if I was naughty but that you know that that was fine um, it spoke very pragmatically about my um, time in the military um, so it was all probably more like a contact report you know very matter of fact opposed to um, actually talking about your feelings or your emotions around that and I think that's a huge skill to try and learn upon because I definitely struggled to be able to talk about essentially me and how I felt about things because I talk about things from a um, you know things from a, a factual perspective um, like this happened this happened opposed to I felt like um, so there's quite a bit of a difference there I think and then um Anyway, so that, that conversation wrapped up with, uh, you know, it sounds like you uh, you just need to stop drinking and, uh, yeah, everything's fine. I was like, oh, awesome. I thought that's exactly what I needed to hear. Nothing wrong with me. Good to go. Just just need to knock, knock the drinking on the head. But, you know, it'll be all right. So that, that was, and I felt much better for a week. Did you knock the drink on the head? No, yeah. That can, uh, be the, uh, that can uh, be the uh, issue. Uh, it can, uh, it can yeah. be one issue, right? It can, it can be sometimes. I'm not saying it was you. I'm saying it can, like, it can be you're fucking, by the way, you drink it all the time. Why do you think you're depressed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but is, is that also a symptom as well, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so um, that, that, that's yeah, yeah. where, and I, I don't think it was, you know, it definitely wasn't um, dependence on alcohol, but, and it was like the first couple of pints, you know, which would be nice and enjoyable. And, and then after that, it would slowly start to, to decline. And then, after a while, you know, probably almost turned into more self-harming with alcohol. Um, and, you know, that was a difficult little spiral. I don't think, as I'm sure you're aware, but the re any sort of form of recovery definitely isn't, a, you know, a gradual process just going up. It's a spiky scribble all over the place. What do you mean self-harm? What do you mean you self-harm with alcohol? So, go on. So, as I end up, um, you know, after having X amount of pints or drinks or whatever, the, you know, logical, logical Stefan would say, cool, let's go home. Like, part of me that was like, essentially struggling with me in whatever aspect would then be like, no, we, we know this is a bad route, but we're going down here. And obviously that, that can... That can be a very uh, dark hole as well, as well. If you if you go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, I used to visualize myself. Um, I used to visualize myself dropping, dro randomly dropping in the street or wherever, unconscious because I drank so much. And I would do that while I was drinking at my worst times. I do that while I was drinking. I think I think if that relate, I think it relates in some way that we all talk about. I'd not, but I'd not thought about it in this context in this way before. And it would be start drinking and I would be drink to get obliterated, knowing exactly what I was doing. And but I'd like I said, I would visualize myself going just dropping. And it wouldn't be in a, I wouldn't think, oh, that'd be bad. I would be like, that that's gonna happen. Just keep going. Do you <laughs> do you think that was a little bit of um the competitiveness of drinking within terms of military culture? Or not? Bit, bit of a but, uh, no, that's probably how the habit started. Yeah. That's probably part of the, the habit started out binge drinking. I mean, I used to drink every fucking day. Oh, yeah. Before I had any, you know, yeah. well, arguably before I, you know, it was just, I used to drink regularly, but I could also just switch it off if I had a course the next day. Yep. If I had something, like, okay, don't drink this evening. Like, for example, Same. and then that yeah. changed to I couldn't switch that off anymore. And then, the, but the, the, the drink into oblivion, that would, I, would, I was, I was to, it was to mask stuff. It was, it was just a coping mechanism. Do you think you were aware of that at the time? Of what, of actually actively masking something? No, 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 not that's at all. Exactly, not at all. It became it became hab habitual, and and I just that's the way I, that's the way I did things. And, and I think that was exactly the same with me as well. Um, that it was, it was a behaviour that was happened consciously. I say consciously. I wasn't consciously um, 
you know, almost drinking self-harm, but it's what was happening, especially when I look back at it on reflection. So then um, th these sort of patterns, beha um, patterns of behavior carried on and um, ended up speaking to the doctor and, you know, straight away they said, oh, do you want some medication? I was like, no, nope, I'm all right, thanks. Um, they were like, good, happy with that. Um, you know, we recommend that you can go to this course and you can go on there. And th this this happened a few times with me going back to the GP. And this is this is one of the key things and one thing that I recommend if anyone is going to go out and speak to the doctor about their um, mental health. And it comes back to that, um, that skill set of being able to talk about your feelings as well, especially when you sit into, you, essentially you're going to meet a stranger, open up and talk about your feelings, and it's very unnatural. Um, so I found it really difficult to be able to talk about, so they'd say, you know, what's going on? You're like, well, or, you know, you very British sort of beh um, behavior. You're right. Well, obviously not, because I'm at the doctor, but yeah, I'm right. <laughs> um, so anyway, I ended up, and. My, my part of advice is to write a list down on your phone in some aspect. Well, it doesn't matter where you write down. But then when you go in to speak to the doctor, and you, you can list things off. Because I found that my anxiety would sort of get in the way. So of what I was trying to be able to, or what I probably needed to be able to communicate to the doctor for them to be able to understand the problem wasn't what I was actually saying. So I went there and um, I read out this list and they went, cool. Um, we're not going to section you, but you will be in secondary mental health services by this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, so we're not going to, and by this point, um, where I'd seen them a few times, um, I did go into, um, a few different medications and, um, that initially I didn't want to go on any medication. And, and I think it was like the second time I went back to the doctor. I was like, yeah, obviously it's not working going my way. So let, let, let's try this avenue. Um, so then it was like the third or fourth time that I spoke to the doctor, had this list, and then um, went into secondary uh, mental health services. So then I seen a psychiatrist the following day, and then um, was allocated a care coordinator, um, which sort of maps your pathway to recovery. Um, <clears throat> but it's like... And th there's different aspects of what you're going to need to be able to get better or improve and I think all the hard work has to come from yourself and I think that's absolutely um, key within this um, but so the the medications increased quite a bit um, and I just sort of struggled on and I was doing lots of other aspects so, you know I'd, you know with work I'd still be still be cracking on with work and I'd be taking on all these different bits and um, and I'd still be being really busy um, but just really struggling inside but without without really knowing how to communicate that or deal with it really um i say say deal with it as if it's a problem and it is a problem but i think it's more accept it and then you can then start to build on that opposed to just trying to push it away and be like cool we'll crack this we'll get it out of the way and then we'll move on because i don't think that's very very useful it wasn't very useful for me having that sort of outlook Hence, the more more destructive behaviours. So, um, as the medication increased, um, my destructive behaviours <laughs> sort of increased as well. Um, and then the the psychiatrist. So, I had seen a few different psychiatrists, and um, the, the psychiatrist that I built up a good rapport with, and that was because I think initially I had like two different people, and then it just stayed with this one set of psychiatrist, and. Um, They'd say, you know, was, you know, the same sort of questions that you're asked, you know, was it anything in childhood? Was it anything in, um, you know, from the military? I'm like, no, I don't think it was anything from the military. Um, you know, so it's like really struggling with trying to pin a diagnosis because I think the obvious option is, right, you're in the military, you went out on tour, therefore that's why you're ill, you know, or you have ill mental health and it's PTSD, which I don't think is often the case um it absolutely is for some people um but i think that's a really difficult area for people that have been in the military and then they go and see the doctor and then they're essentially labeled with ptsd or you know even it outside the um seeing the doctor's like oh it must be ptsd or you're, you're branded with that 
And it's like, well, that doesn't tell you anything of who that person is. And if it's not what is going on, that's probably not going to be very helpful to that person want to be able to get better. But then also they can then cling on to that as an identity of that's why they're real. And it might not be the case at all. And um, yeah, uh, we can maybe come back onto that a little bit later. It, does, um, it doesn't have to be an event. It doesn't have right. to, it doesn't, there doesn't have to be an event. Like everything, like ill health, someone mentally ill. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a specific event that caused that thing. And the same with the physical health. Like, it doesn't have to be, a f like, literally, it doesn't have to be a physical event. You have a, f to, for you, that happened, that caused a physical ailment. Like, a, like an, a, a, you know, a, a, an external event, you know what I mean? It's like, go, uh, going back to the alcohol side of things. And, that, like, someone who's exhibiting at signs of alcoholism, right, and depression, and erratic behaviour, and this, and then X, Y, and Z, it doesn't have to have been a... Well, let's say the military. It doesn't have to have been a oh they were in they were on this operation or they uh, this happened to them or or even if they're not military or this person was in a car crash or they saw someone get killed. It doesn't have to be an event. It could be that they started drinking alcohol like everyone does, and then they go to the public everyone does, and they just they weren't able to and they started drinking regularly every day, and then all that and then next thing you know they're dependent on the alcohol. And next thing you know they've also got anxiety, they've also got depression, they've also got erratic behaviour, and, and all that links back to this. No specific event. Yeah. They just let a, a substance control get get out, out of the way. It's a really interesting point you mentioned about the PTSD and all that. I, sorry, I just wanted to mention no, that. because cool. because and it's important. It is an important point because people and there are people who listen to this podcast who do experience mental health issues and and most of the time we are conditioned to think it all links back to an event. It isn't always. Often it's the case, it isn't always the case. And it's not like 99.9% .9 of the time it is the case, it's an event that happened to cause this to you to go, and that's what you do. It's not, it's more like 60 40, I reckon, 70 30. And it might not be a case or an event that you're aware of either, which I think is a really interesting point as well. Because yeah. I think that's one of the, um, so we've sort of gone into this, but with anything in the, if it's within the military or PTSD, and you know, I'm sort of putting those two together, but if it's a specific event, which you know might have been something in a contact that um or something that you think is worthy of being acceptable for why you're experiencing mental ill health and it might not be the case and i think that can be a really and i think that part of being able to accept or acknowledge that you're a little bit unwell and then saying oh it's because of this but because that's worthy within your own mind but it might have been something completely different but one you're either aware of or not aware of but then that's you know you probably need to uh, let's say address but you need to get to the root cause of the problem in order to be able to fix it at least and if you're focusing in the wrong area if you, you know if you're looking left of arc when you should be focusing right then you're, you're never going to be able to identify the the issue um, and the more you focus on looking in the wrong direction it's highly likely that things are going to get worse within that time pit frame. Anyway, I'll come back on um, to, to where I was with the uh, seeing the psychiatrist and um, yeah, sorry, no, sorry. Sorry. sorry, um, and then the, the the medication increasing in the 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 I say destructive behaviours and it's probably been a bit b broad there with destructive behaviours because essentially we're talking about suicide and uh, not solely, but that was definitely a huge part of it, and there was a handful of times where it was very close to me. And I've, I've always called them near misses opposed to a failed attempt. But there's definitely quite a few near misses. Well, um, well, you did try, you tried to kill yourself. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's, that's been with, um, as, as it sort of went on and on, um, it, I guess, it became less, less fussed in a way emotionally. Like, probably not a be great way of describing. You it. mean each time? But desensitized time. to it. D desensitized to actually to giving a shit about killing, about killing myself. Right. Okay. So, uh, and that—that's where I think things are most dangerous and difficult because you're in distress. That's very unpleasant, but that's what's keeping you alive. So suffering it's shit it 
it's it's just shit. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there's many areas we could talk about that, but ultimately it's shit. And it's, but it can be the one thing that's helping you stay alive when you're in those really dark, really dark moments, and it is fucking painful. But um, it can be that one thing that's helping keeping you alive. Then, like one of the one of the last times I almost went through with it all, um, and my my dog started squealing at me, and then I was like, "Fuck it out!" Like, and then then got down um, from it, it just about to hang myself, and then yeah, that was that was a bit of a why was the dog, why did the dog why did the dog squeal at you? I did it. I think the dog could, she, she's awesome, but she can definitely tell if. I'm uh, quite anxious or distressed and really, like me and her are really, really in tune. Um, non-dog, non-dog people are going, fuck off, Stefan. But I know, I know what you mean. No, it's true. It's, it's like, yeah. I, I, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, destructive behaviors. Because I was just sort of, I felt like I was doing it a bit of a disservice because like, you know, just ha- st- spending too long in the pub and it, there was that. But and then you know going out on all night benders, um, which sort of goes full circle with what I was saying about that um, that suffering with your mental health, because there was another evening where I was very close to going through with it, and then ended up drinking, and then that took me on a very interesting forty eight hours. <laughs> Do you um, want to elaborate or not? <laughs> No, don't have yeah, to no, no, don't no, have to let, let, let's, but, um, so, uh, and, uh, anyway, so ended up getting to the pub, friend ended up dropping me into town, into Bristol, um, just cracked a night out on my own, uh, and then, it was more of those, like I said, self-destructive behaviours, you know, just, just, um, just drinking, just constantly drinking, and, um, I wasn't enjoying myself, you know, whilst I was out, um, and that, that that's one one of the key aspects. And I think if anyone looked over and gone, fucking hell, that's that's a bit of a sad state there. And yeah, it's true. Um, but anyway, so so I went to leave this um, this club after it finished. And I was probably just about to go home, and then somebody passed out. Um, and it was I think it was some young uni student. So um, anyway, just waiting for them to be able to get picked up. Um, and good use of Siri, just hold, um, you can say call whoever on their own phone. And then they were like, oh, yeah, we'll come and get them. I think it was their parents. It was like, we'll see. Sort them out. They were you know, probably like 18 years old or whatever. Anyway. Call mum, call dad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, anyway, so, so I'm heading home. And then there's this uh, this homeless person. And I was in quite a, quite a vulnerable state anyway. And I thought, right, do a good thing here. And... Uh, I'll make sure I look after this person <laughs> in my in my infinite wisdom of and it's not like I was thinking rationally at this point anyway and I think let's bring it into context not five hours earlier I was about to kill myself as well so you know you might be like oh this isn't very logical no shit <laughs> there's not a great there's not a great deal of logic to this anyway so um I thought wait right, this person's clearly dependent on drugs you know, so they're, they're going to need their fix. So, um, so I sort of went with them along, and I oh, went along to them to this uh, this crack den. Ended up there, and um, yeah, and ju- just to put it into perspective, I was wearing a moleskin waistcoat with a dicky bow tie. <laughs> I've ended up in a crack den, <laughs> and it's like, what? The earth Did you have is the going beard? On? I think I, had, I definitely had the beard. I might have had it. I don't think I no. I didn't have a handlebar moustache at the time because when I first left, I had a handlebar moustache. But um, yeah, I had the beard. I, I just looked completely ridiculous. Um, and anyway, so I ended up smoking crack and heroin at that that evening. Um, so like I said, an interesting forty-eight hours. Um, and eventually through an act of kindness of somebody else the next day, they were able to like, look, I'll pay for you, but just get yourself home. I was like, awesome. But I think that, that sort of ties into that distress of, you know, really destructive behaviors, really suffering with that. 
but that also being a way of being able to keep you alive because if I didn't go off on, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying at any point it was right to do that, but if, potentially if I hadn't taken that pathway, I'd have been dead anyway. <laughs> so it, yeah. you know, it's, it's easy to look at it and like shame it. Um, but spending that 48 hours uh, with my newfound friends at that given point, um, you know, I think it's really understandable when somebody's in those positions and they're always trying to get out of it. And then if, you know, you've got heroin there or, or they tend to mix um, crack and heroin together. But I think that's really understandable of those patterns of behavior. Do you think it's choosing, er do you think it's choosing erratic behaviors, right? Or do you think it's, uh, sorry, do you think it's deliberately acting erratically, right? Or do you think it's not uh, losing the ability to, to uh, for rational thought and logical thought and logical decisions and rational decisions? Because from my perspective, for me, uh, don't get me wrong, I didn't spend 48 hours in a crack then, right? But I think for me, it was less choosing like crazy erratic behaviors. It was more, um, over the different different things, it was more... I just ration all rationale and all logic. Well, it just started gradually just disintegrated my ability to, to, to just all became blurred, you know? And, and, uh, yeah, so it was, it was less a deliberate choice of, I'm going to just do destructive things here. Yeah. I don't think it, I think you could see that it's, or I could definitely identify this isn't, if someone said, come over and ask me, is this a good choice? You know, I would have even known that within myself that it's not a good choice. Um, but I, I did it anyway. And that was that sort of self-destruct. And that's why I sort of tied into that self-harming behaviors. Because I knew they were the bad options. Fuck it. What have I got to lose? Um, and recklessness. So there was that aspect of those reckless and um, poor behaviors. Poor behaviors? Poor, bad um, patterns of behaviors. Um, and then you also, at the time, I uh, uh, had a motorbike as well. And then, oh God. that's a, not combining the two, but that recklessness. Um, so I had a fire blade be before, came off of that. Um, so I bought a tramp scrambler. I you came it, off as then you fell off? I fell off, yeah. Okay. I decided it. And then, um, then I had a tramp scrambler. I was like, you know, nice looking bike. Um, yeah, nice and sensible riding. But you could push that bike within 98% of its ability where you can't do that with a fire blade unless you go Martin. So, and that's what was happening. That, you know, although it's not as quick as a motorbike, I was acting very recklessly in order to feel alive, I think, or chase. And chase a thrill, but not in a healthy way. And where having very little care for my own life you know, I was aware of the risks, but I didn't really care about the consequences as long as it didn't affect anybody else. That was probably one of the benefits of benefits is a bad choice of word, but if being on a motorbike that if something happens, it's index for me. But then, although that wasn't a conscious thought when I got out on the bike and you know, rode off down the road and I was like, I'm just going to go for a nice little enjoyable ride after 15 minutes, 20 minutes and, you know, you're getting faster and faster and you're like, you know, you, you're really pushing the edge and then, um, and you're pushing that bike to its ability. Um, that's because it's a slower bike, not because of my amazing bike riding skills. Um, and uh, anyway, so there was those, all those bad behaviours going on and that's why I was on lots of medication as well. So that was sort of all tied in. And the, the psychiatrist, um, we're struggling to figure out a diagnosis of what it, what, why are you unwell? Um, is a so they sent me off for an MRI in case there was something, um, you know, um, anything physically wrong with the brain, um, and that, that came back all clear. And then I was um, <coughs> I was put with a psychologist um, to do a formulation to sort of try and understand, mainly for the clinical side, to try and be able to get a diagnosis to be able to essentially help me get 
better in whatever aspect. So um, that started off, and then you know it was all the sort of basic questions as as I had before initially. And again, I'd answer them pragmatically, and I'd sort of done this a few times by now because I've been a handful of different changeovers in staff within this time frame because this has gone over at least two years um, of being from when I first reached out to combat stress I think it was um, and and combat stress did say you know the door's very much open you're welcome to come back but for me I didn't feel like that was an option at that point as well um, and it was I don't think it's easy I don't think it's easy um, by any aspect to be able to go go in somewhere, like I said, vulnerably, and ask for help. And then being able to access that genuinely by being honest about your poor mental health, if that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm communicating that in the best way. But um, anyway, so I put up a rapport with this psychologist and... Um, you know, same answer, you know, I get a whack if I was a kid, if I was naughty. And, you know, it's like, right, okay, well, what is a naughty kid? And, you know, I'm not saying that this was, you know, and there's not blame, but looking back at it and then reflecting at uh, areas where I didn't think there was an issue. So I, actually, I did grow up in a bit of an unsafe household. And that is very understandable of why those actions and um, behaviours have manifested in those different directions. Um and it would be it would be very easy to blame um, blame my upbringing for that, but that's for me. I don't think that's going to be particularly helpful. It's like right, we'll understand that. And some of the some of the work that um, so that then went on um, to having a formulation, um, and then after a while went into um, more work with the psychologist. Um, and uh, intervention work and explored some of those things a little bit more and that is some of the toughest stuff i've ever done what do you mean and Get, going to uh, that child, yeah. childhood stuff emotional ex exploration yeah is that what you mean yeah. because i think doing things physically uh, or you know similar to the military where you've got um physical color physical courage and moral courage but i think that that was the biggest amount of moral courage and then because you're 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 stepping into the dark and the unknown and you don't know what you're going to find out until you get there. And some of that, you know, there's got to be a lot of home truths and you've got to be, you know, really honest with yourself. Um, even if you're not actively speaking about it to, you know, the clinician or anybody else, but doing that hard work yourself, bloody painful. And that can be really unsettling and that, that's one thing that I found really interesting. Because um, I thought, actually, was after listening to one of the H House with Jason Tyler back along, um, and he said about how when he's worked with a psychologist, and um, this was just when I first started doing the work, and he said about it all, and I remember listening to that podcast, and um, he said about um, just essentially having a breakdown and a cry, and then things start to move on. And I thought, happy days, like, because I really struggled to be able to cry. I was like, all I need to do is cry, have it out, <laughs> job done. Yeah, that didn't happen. Um, and so some of the sessions where I go and I talk about more harder things, I would have, ex I didn't really feel, I felt all right after going to the session. And then um, I thought, you know, almost performance based in myself, um, you know, did, it, did I do enough within that session to be able to get the most out of it? And then there was, an, you know, a couple of other sessions where I felt like I didn't really talk about that much. Um, about anything hard and I'd then get you know leave and I go in the car to drive home and it'd be like fucking hell like a wall of emotion had just hit me I'm like well, what's all this about and I think it was that that voluntary probably where I just let my guard down a bit more because I wasn't trying to force having those um, talk about those harder things that just sort of gradually navigating that um myself essentially um was <laughs> um tractor. Yeah. if anyone can hear that that rumbling it's the tractor i think it's cutting the 
grass on the pitch outside the uh, studio. Your old lamps. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. About. And, um, hopefully, the, it's not too loud on the mic for them. Right? And um, yeah, so that that um, so there was that that part of psycho um, the work with the psychologist that I did. Um, some of it, like there was a, probably one thing from Herrick, um, and it was more of just a. It was something that I spoke to Bags actually about um, on a stag do um, uh, around the time that I entered um, mental health services, and it was it was just a um, something that didn't sit that well with me morally, and it was to do with my own actions. Um, and I absolutely made the right decision. It was probably best described as um, that part of courageous restraint. It's like should I, shouldn't I? And I, I absolutely did the right thing. Um, but it, and it's not anything that anyone else would have noticed, um, but it was just the reflection on that. And even at the time, and even when I was in, probably didn't even pay any attention to it, but then afterwards, after getting out, going, should I or shouldn't I? Of And, you know, you can almost get yourself, start beating yourself up around these, um, the, these different um, thought processes, which isn't necessarily hel- helpful, but then I think just letting it lay dormant as well equally isn't particularly helpful. So it's just having that balanced balanced measure to it. Um, anyway, so and then I, ca- um, I came off medication, which was really good because not only was I struggling with, um, you know, I was really struggling with um, tinnitus as well. And so they, they said, oh, you know, there's nothing to do with, because um, I spoke to the care coordinator about it. They said, oh, you, you just need to go and see the GP about that. So Okay, went spoke to the GP, and they were like, oh, it's in both ears, right? Okay, um, go off to the ears, nose, and throat specialist, and spoke to the consultant. I told him about everything else that's going on because of the old, uh, the, the little guess of, um, you know, when the, bleeps. the little bleeps, you know, when wondering if you're actually hearing things or not, and um, <laughs> that's a hearing test for anyone who's unaware. Um, and then, yeah, everything came back um, relatively right. A little bit of little bit of damage but that was fine um no, nothing moderate oh sorry nothing extreme and um i said about that i recently had an mri so we had a little look at that I pulled up the files and he was like yeah i think this is all down to psychological components there's nothing physically going wrong because i think their main concern at the time was potentially a growth or something going on in the brain because of the symptoms that i was describing um and then also struggling with um say short-term memory loss but i'll be in the middle of a conversation most sentences and i'll be halfway through and wait what was on about so you know so and then when i came off the medication that slowly started to improve and um i think it's really important to work with the psychiatrist i don't think anyone should be going off and freestyling it and think that they know they know best but that was one of the key things the psychiatrist would say oh you know We've got this option. We've got this option. What do you want to do? And I'm, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. So what, you, you tell me. And they, they, they'll then flip that back and go, and you're the patient. What, what, what's going to help you? And I think it's, I don't think medication was um, beneficial to me in hindsight. Um, I think it actually caused a lot more pain and suffering. However, I wouldn't have known that unless I went there. So again, there was more lessons learned. But it was a bloody sharp knife edge that I was running at times as well. How quick have you listened to Mandy Bostwick's podcast? Uh, that, that episode and Mark Gordon's episode. Quite a while back, yeah. Well, Mark's not so long ago, but Mandy's winning. Yeah. How crazy? How crazy is it that when you talk about mental health stuff, um, especially ex-military uh, and and you know you know sports and all the rest of it, how crazy is it that they they don't look? at the neurophysiological side. To me, and the more, like, it really frustrates me, and, uh, but the more I think about it, the more it frustrates me. So, and, but the more it's like, just mad, it's mental. It's just like mental. What, what, what are we doing? Uh, what, what's your thoughts? I'm mean, really interested in your thoughts on it. Because you, you, uh, you know, well, yeah, what are your thoughts on it? <laughs> I, th- I think you do definitely need to look at all components. Um, I think it's really interesting what's going on there. Um, and I've tried that through the, podcast um I, I need to get onto the website and have a proper read of it and i've listened to the joe rogan uh, podcast as well um with mark and andrew, andrew yeah. Maya, yeah. um but 
I think that that's one one component of it. Um, but you've also um, got the other aspect of the individual. So, and that, that has to be the balance of the two, um, because even if there is, um, you know, s someone's got um, symptoms in whatever way, and you can you can treat the symptoms, but then you've still got the other parts of how that person copes. Mm. And, and perception, yeah, and your, the perception of experience and all the rest of it. I think what frustrates me is is uh, and what I think is mental is that we it, it at the moment we don't look and consider all of the things. So we're only considering this. We don't we look at the psychiatry, which could be an impact on <laughs> the psychiatry, right? But we don't look at then the other the sort of physiology side. Yeah. I mean, to me, to me, it's like you got a you got a knee injury, yeah. And you only you you're only looking at the skeletal the skeletal structure. You only look at the patella. You only look at the the end of the femur. You only look at the, the way the skeleton is. You're not bothering to look at the ligaments and the muscles. You just, you're only looking at one part. You're not looking at the other things to try and identify what the issue is now to overcome it. Yeah. That, that's why wouldn't you look at it all? That, you know that's that's so, that's what annoys me. Because I'm not what I'm not saying. Sorry, what I'm not insinuating is that there is always a neurophysiological. Uh, cause i think that'd be really to naive to always yeah. assume everything blanketly but i think that that was a really good analogy that you said of the person with the skeletal system um because yes that person might have a knee injury and you've got to understand why that's going on and all, you know it's not just the you know um all those other um parts that make that leg move and that whole how that person then moves but you've also got why does that person need to be able to move oh because they're a track athlete or you know wh what is it that they're doing and how is that then affecting them because if you've got a, a runner who then can't run you know you're already then getting into secondary components mm -hmm. so and that's sort of what i was tying into with the um you know you can treat the the symptoms uh, or the not so much the, you, you could treat the traumatic brain injury for example um, or treat that um, event of trauma, but then that doesn't necessarily help with, um, you know, reasons of um, the other areas of why they're depressed, um, why why they're anxious, any sort of feelings of neglect, especially within terms of childhood areas, um, and that sense of belonging and acceptance. Because I don't think you have to be severely unwell. Um, to be struggling like at what point do you go right there's a cut off line you you can have help you can't yeah, you know, it's, yeah. you've got to look at the individual as well and then figure out what, what's going to be best for their needs and also for them to be able to I think a lot of the work and I'm not really answering your question on um, and it's mainly because I don't know too much no, about no, the um, uh, TBI aspect sorry kicking things under um but uh, yeah, I think I think there's got to be a balance of the two, and I I think it's really interesting. I do think that because there's the other part of everything that's going on with um, Mandy and Mark, and that's the politics of it as well, which I think's interesting. But I don't think you can I don't think you can tackle one without the other. I don't think you can openly address um, at a societal level, for example, issues with trauma without addressing and. Um, without addressing the um, political aspects as well mm. and and just mental health with it as well because you know you could look at a lot of people and I know I'm very generalizing here but somebody who's um, depressed and all these other components and then it's like right well why is that and it's like well one of the aspects is because they've got no money or very little money and they're on the food bank and then they're really struggling to get by well, that's something that's a political aspect that all the p politics of that then feed into that person being able to get a job and that filtering down into those individual aspects of society. So I don't think you can ta just say, ha, we have a magic pill. And I'm not saying that uh, like, in, in any aspect, I think it, a, lot of, a lot of these issues are very complex is what I'm getting at. Yeah, it's interesting about the uh, you know you, you're saying about at what point should uh, you know well, at what point should should is there a cut off for mental health and the treatment of, and how do you measure the severity of someone's illness? And I think the reality is that 
no doctor, no psychiatrist. They, they they can't. They wouldn't. They're not able to get into everyone's mind to understand that. That's for the individual to decide. And then, but how does an individual do it? And I think you know, at what point do do I or the Stefan or this flipping Emily, John, or Joseph, whoever, think, okay, I, I am now at a point where I think I need to get help. And for me, I think, uh, reflecting with me, it would be if there's an aspect of my life that I, I can no longer control, an aspect of my emotions or a habit, a bad habit, you know, a behavior that I cannot control. You know, an example of that would be alcohol. An example of that would be anxiety. A fe- it could be a feeling, okay? mm. consciously anxious. And I, I'm, I'm doing things based on things I've read online or you know, just information, the point is people trying to help me to try and get a grip of the anxiety and I can't and I can't. You know, okay. Well, I. It's at the point you go. I I can't do this. I need some. I need something else to help me along. <laughs> Depression and just general unhappiness. Yeah. You know, and and only, like going back. Only I know where my baseline is, and only I know what I what I can and can't control. And even that part of control, it's if you if if it's a it could be dietary eating crap. You know, because it's all, you, have, you have to take a holistic approach to it yeah, all, yeah. right? You have to. You know, if I like what I know now is that if I, um, I'll just bend. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you messing with my mic booms? No one touches the knobs. What have we done there oh, now? No. Carry on, Jesus carry on. Christ. Christ. <laughs> just, just bring it in. I, I only did that to spring it up. You fucking ruined Done it now. Jesus Fix it. Christ. Just stay in this um, position. Uh, so, like, I, so like, I know, like you're saying, my experience all brought me to a point where I'm just now more, I am just more uh, 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 sensitive to m- when my emotional s- state changes, right? Yeah. That's one. And that can be achieved without going through hardship. Yeah. I just, ha- so happens, I achieved this really good place where I am now in terms of my emotional awareness. I achieved it through going through absolute crap times. Now, it can be achieved. It could have been achieved if I was uh, was given the knowledge and I was taught this from from a child, you know, like, oh, wellness well-being emotional awareness and, and how you can and how you can improve the way you are right um uh, but so the point i am now i know like if i was to if i was to go on a bender today right let's go back if i was feeling really anxious today loads of anxiety um uh feeling really stressed um i would i would first i'm aware of it I go, oh, okay. It wouldn't just be like a background thing. And then I would try and, you talk about root cause analysis. It's, it's five whys. I go, okay, why? Why is that? And if I went on a bender yesterday, like all day session, for me now, now for me, an all day session causes me massive anxiety the next day. I know that, okay, why? That's the reason why. Okay, and I also know that if that happens, I, you call it hair the dog, but I want to get on a bender again today. But I know because of past experience, and my understanding is if I go on a bender today, I guaranteed will be drinking every day next week because it'll impact my ability to control my behaviours. And then I'll start drinking. So I'm not talking about getting them in the morning and drinking, yeah. but drinking in the evening, getting smashed. Well, why the fuck would I do that every day? But it happened because I started drinking yesterday, which makes things harder for me to control. Then anxiety gets worse. Things that fix my anxiety for me, alcohol. But things that cause anxiety for me, alcohol. <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, this and is it's the, also a coping mechanism as well. So I don't think... And I think this is a real, really interesting part with alcohol because I know when I was um, just, just say, struggling for the moment without getting into all the weeds... Um, but is that that shame around it as well? Because you know, the more you the more you drink, that someone else then goes, "Oh, you know, you shouldn't be drinking," or, um, or it's the alcohol, and it's that. Yeah, I'm not explaining this very well. C- carry on. Uh, yeah. So the point I was saying, you know, it's it. Uh, again, you and I talk about mental health, well-being, and I talk about a lot with guests like this, and it sounds, you know, it's not like. It's not like I'm like some flipping guru at it now. Like other people talk about it. You get lots of people talk about it. It's not like we're gurus at it. We we sort of just at a position where we're more emotionally sensitive. And I, you know, I, I, and we just, yeah, we're just more aware. I'm just more aware of when my mood changes, right? That's fine. And some people like that anyway. But I act on it straight away. Whereas previously, it would it would get to a point where, you know, the stress and anxiety levels would build up, you know, 
of whatever behaviors would build up before it just went longer before I decided to try and do something about it or became aware of it. And then it, and then it's just harder, further down it's harder. So now it's a quick, quick fix. You know, I look at what the issue is and it's not always like an alcohol or, or whatever. It, it can be like work. You know, if I know, like, I, I, I do really enjoy it. It's like Friday, I give that talk to, to, to OTC. And I knew that that was going to cause me a bit of anxiety leading up to it because I'm going to be publicly speaking and all the rest of it. And I also knew that from past hours, I'll leave things to the last minute. I perform better at last minute. I like, I, you know, I've, I've written my best talks literally two hours before I've ever done anything. But I also know that that habit causes me anxiety and stress throughout the week because in the back of my head going, I'm not doing anything, I'm not, I'm not, doing, I'm not doing any preparation. Blah, blah, blah. So I'll just, in that week leading up last week, I jot a couple of bullet points down, as in inverted commas, preparation i just an activity to sort of well, i started now i started prepping for friday I'm absolutely fine but i also fully conscious of again whittle down be conscious of the bad bad diet like bad behavior bad behaviors eat eat well try and minimize alcohol consumption because i know there's a stress of being caused externally i can't control the fact the only thing i could do to control that stress that the uotc talk was causing me was to not do the OTC talk, the OTC talk. Well, that's not a choice I want to make. I want to do the talk, right? But if I know that uh, that stressor is there and I, I have to go through with it because I've decided to go through with it, I can balance, I can be more conscious of everything else to lead it and not make it into a flipping, binge drinking week, do it, you know, bad behaviors, eating crap because I'm stressed, not performing badly at work. Um, and that's, that's, that's all the, the sort of the mental health thing is to me when you when you when your mental health takes a dip somewhere or something isn't going quite right in life somewhere it's early identification of it and as you said what is the cause why okay why am i why have i got anxiety oh because I, I went on a piss yesterday on a bender and you shouldn't have why did you go on the piss yesterday when i bend and you shouldn't have why what caused that why because i've got a lot of stress going on at work and i've got a bad week coming up Okay, well, th- there's the root cause. Let's let's address that. How do you deal with that? And I, I think addressing it kindly is one of the key key issues. Addressing so it what? Kindly. Kindly. But, yeah, because uh, you can put them funny faces, but it'd be very easy to sort of shame yourself, going, um, oh, "I'm too stressed at work. Um, you know, I shouldn't be stressed at work. I'll have a drink," and then allowing that to manifest in more destructive behaviors, essentially being aware of it, but not being able to shame or being aware not to shame reasons why. And then I think, so I I do a lot of self-reflection and sounds like you do as well, but you can, I think it's very easy to start shaming yourself. Um, It was for me in areas where that I went out drinking the other day, I shouldn't be doing that. I'll then feel shame. And then that, um, you know, just manifests it within terms of that poor, poor, uh, mental health, essentially and thought process, because then it becomes more destructive. So just having that balance with it. But then if you were to structure everything out as well, and then be like, right, I can do, I can do all these things to look after myself. You know, you've got some fun in there as well and actually live life. I think that's, that's, this is my take and it's sort of going off, but um, whilst, whilst very unwell, obviously, about to say obviously, but I came to ask myself, what's the reasons for life? Why am I alive? And I just came to the conclusion, um, love. It doesn't matter what for, even if, if you like just love, and I don't care how this sounds, I think, you know, um but love for anything you know even if it's plants bees you know people just beauty of the day anything like th- there's a reason to live um but we all need need to find different as so that was something that i was aware of but didn't help me uh not want to save my life so i was like oh cool figured out there's a reason to live but i didn't want it um so yeah, that was that was a difficult bit. Mm. 
You got a list of notes, sir. Huh? Yeah, no, this is it's some notes I had in that talk. Um, because I, but I, do you know one of the reasons I like doing stuff like that? Because it, 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 I have to, when you're talking about emotional stuff, when you talk about emotions, you have to do a bit, you dig a bit deeper into your own, closer to you, into your own soul, and you understand things a bit better. And wh when I was prepping for that talk, I realized that there's, the, uh, yeah, there's, this, it's four things. And this, these, this list probably goes for everyone, most people, right? And I talked about holistic approach earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you have to look at your mental health, and not just mental health, but you, you're how well you're able to perform cognitively, right? Because there's, there's these things to talk about. You can, you can, you can set yourself out to perform fucking excellent mentally, be that in a talk, be that on an exam, be that whatever. You can perform excellently compared to what you normally would, right? And so, there's, I have a list of four things, and these things are all I, I. I I realized uh, last week I was prepping the talk. These are the things I look at straight away when my when I'm exhibiting a bad behavior. <laughs> like, I mean, keep going back to alcohol. Alcohol is my advice. Like alcohol or well, not so much erratic behavior. Anything, or bad choices. You know, or the, not the greatest choices, right? Um, or another behavior of mine, which is, a, which is a combat indicator that something is falling off the cliff somewhere or starting to roll down the hill slightly. The other combat indicator is avoiding, of of uh, is avoid avoiding decision making. <laughs> I avoid. I I went through a few years of that. I, co I couldn't make decisions. How do you mean? Oh, I couldn't make decisions. So, um, do you, do, you, yeah. do you want uh, do you want chicken or beef for dinner, Hugh? Whatever, I don't care. Yeah, didn't want to make a decision. I'm like I obviously have a preference. <laughs> But I didn't want to make a decision, um, and that, but that, that is a, a, like an amusing example of the dinner side. But then you, when you take that to uh, uh, things like receiving an email at work, which you knew, which has you need to make a decision on, be that how you're going to respond, or it's a, an answer that someone needs from you, and you, and it, and it, and, and you part, you don't, don't even look at the, the email. Nah. Not even you don't even respond yeah. to that email. You park it and then you fucking forget about it, right? And but that happened repeatedly to financial decisions, a parking ticket, right? and not you know, and not picking up the phone and decide basically deciding to pay the parking ticket or deciding that you want to spend the money to pay for the parking ticket because financially you're in a really bad place. So you don't want to make the decision to spend the money. That materialised into two CCJs for me. I've got two CCJs for two parking tickets from three years ago. Because at the time I was in a hideous place, yep. didn't want to make decisions. Money was like I was on my ass, like real bad, and I made the decision not to spend money, and then I forgot about those, and they cropped up like two years ago. It's fucking CCJs, parking tickets. I've lived with myself for that. <laughs> I've lived with myself. You know, of all the things, give me a CCJ for not paying rent or something. But sorry, going back, the four the four things, right? That for me that I, I immediately look at and go, okay, I, I've been bad behaviours or not performing like I should do, or I feel a bit shit, what are they? What? Which one of these? And the four things are work. Okay, look at work. Is that what's changed at work? What's happening at work? Nutrition. Have I, been putting, have I been eating healthily or have I been eating like shit? Or have I been putting substances in my, substances, too much of a substance in my body that I should be alcohol, for example, flipping drugs, for example, not that I take drugs, right? But dr not not, yeah, cla yeah. not class A's anyway. Uh, any drugs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, work, nutrition, sleep, yeah, and physical activity. Okay, and um, most of the time, when I have a, when I when I have a crap week, I can sometimes get the end of it and go, oh my god, that was an absolute n drama of a week. And most of the time, so recently, I had a horrendous week, and I mean the most horrendous week ever. And I really, really struggled, really struggled, super stressful. The week before, something had changed at work. I, I changed teams at work. And then the week after, so the week that was really bad, I also, I stopped focus, I stopped paying attention how much coffee I was drinking. So normally I'll try and, I'll try and cut off the coffee at 12 o'clock. I was drinking coffee all day long. So those two things. So in hindsight, I looked at it, I went, oh my God, work changed, that special time at work, I should then have gone, right, you need to screw them up for yourself next week. I didn't. Coffee went through the roof, and at the end of the week, it was, it was horrendous. It's like the worst week I, I've had in a long, long time. Yeah, so work, nutrition, sleep, physical activity. And from the holistic approach, you can look at all those. If you can't, it's, you were talking about earlier about try, you know, trying to pinpoint, trying to pinpoint an event or a situation that happened. 
most of the time you ain't going to be able to do that. Agreed. Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, most of the time you ain't going to be able to do that. But what you can do, it doesn't mean you can't fix or improve the situation, right? What you can do is you can look at things that you can impact, like your sleep, like your nutrition, like your physical activity, like routine. And you can look at those and go, right, I'm going to try and be better at some of these things in order to try and uplift my, uplift my and try and tr- improve my body and tr- improve my mind and see how that fares. I'm going to not stop eating shit. I'm going to stop eating shit. I'm going to cut the, I know you're going to talk. Hang on. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to re- reduce the alcohol consumption. I'm going to make sure I get to bed at a timely hour and not go to bed at one, two, three in the morning and then have to be up at eight o'clock for work, whatever. And that's yeah. Anyway, that's it. Well, I'll stop talking now. Sorry, mate. You can talk. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <coughs> throat going then. When is the right time to make any of the decisions, though? And what, there isn't. What decisions? To, to go right. Okay, I can I can um, now improve on you know those little bits and bobs. When it, when is the right time to go? Right now, you know now is the answer. But. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know. I know. And things. there's never a perfect time. No, for anything it, in life. And those things and should that, be at the forefront of anyway, right? They should always be on the back uh, in, your, uh, and in your mind, going, "Okay, these are things I need to do to I need to stay on top of." But, but don't live like a monk. It's yeah. like I don't eat healthily all of the time, just most of the time. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't cut out crap substances from my from my diet. I just try to cut them out most of the time. <laughs> try to cut them out most of the time. Sleep. I don't sleep, flipping yeah. six, seven, eight hours a night every night, but I try to. You know, I know. Go on. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can definitely relate to that. Like even recently, um, I had to put my bike in the, the um, bike shop, to get it repaired. And before that, um, I've been working really hard at work. Um, they put in lots of hours, essentially just sitting on the kitchen table, grafting away, and then doing loads of fizz and when I'm not working. And then, especially that's I think one of the downsides of working from home, especially in the pandemic. It's, it's not, you know, balanced approach to life. So if it was a Friday before, but, um, you know, before the lockdown, I mean, but um, especially living and breathe, like just being, a, being at home, come downstairs, open up the laptop, work, finish, cycle, run, whatever, routine. And then um, I had to put my bike up, um, bike had to go into the bike shop, um, to get some repairs and then I'd stopped running that week as well and I think that was impact as a re- result of the fact that I didn't go out on the bike um, so then I stopped running and then I just buried myself in within work that week and I found that I was getting um, I was consciously aware that I was getting a bit bitter and resentful to certain components which I think is a really unhealthy thing to do so as soon as I start noticing myself being bitter or resentful in any way I'm like right stop take a combo moment what's going on so I, I'm not I'm not moving. I, I've hardly left the house. You know, I've, I've I've walked the dog around the field, and that's it. Um, but I, I'm not moving enough. Um, so yeah, a, address that. Um, things start to improve straight away. Um, you know, obviously there's other components, but you can't control all of those aspects, and that's obviously like an ideal euphoria, I guess. Um, anyway um where you would you know be able to control all these different aspects of your life you know um yes you can control your diet yeah like certain things you're not going to be able to control you're not going to be able to control that person coming to you with work uh with that email going make a decision on this and you know it might be a difficult decision you have to make you that's not a controllable measure to an ex you know because you've got to take that responsibility on that's part of your um day-to-day life but there are there are aspects. Some things will be out of your control, within reason. Um, another as or more difficult to handle or control, and other bits that are just those little components. Get out, go for a run, go out, you know, go for a little walk in the morning before before you start work or whatever they are. There are all these little bits and bobs that you can just help implement to, which might seem quite or the last thing you want to do in that time but we'll have a bigger benefit for getting off and doing it but you said about going for your um going for your talk and then getting a bit anxious before before doing it but you still went off and done it and you you made that decision to 
do something that obviously made you feel a little bit uncomfortable, but it sounds that you're quite happy that you did it in the end. Because oh, you've got to weigh it up, right? Yeah. I mean, imagine if we went through life and didn't do anything that was uncomfortable. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. We'd all be Homer Simpson. You know, it's like, you, you've got to weigh it up. Okay, a little bit of bad for a, a lot of good. Um, uh, but I mean, on the, on, you're on about walking. Uh, the, I use, so again, going back to that sort of emotional awareness, just mental state. Because emotional awareness is a bit of a fluffy term. It's like, it's, I'm aware of my mental state. So I'm aware that when I'm I'm not focusing as much as I need to be. Everyone has that day there they go, oh my god, I just can't get my god, I can't, I just can't, I can't concentrate on what I'm doing. I just can't get my, I can't get my head into this assignment. I can't get my, I need to think. Everyone has that. So for me, the difference is now with, with how I used to deal with that before and how I deal with it now. One, I'm aware of it, and I, uh, I'm aware. No, I'm aware that I can change it. And what I love about um, the physical activity side of things is, if I get into that situation where I do need to focus, I'm, you know, I have work, I do courses, and I do all this other stuff. I, I will. The one thing that can immediately change my brain state. It may not change it to where it needs to be, but it'll get away from the that. You know, it'll get away. It'll change it anyway, and, and hopefully, it'll change it to where I need to be. Is physical activity walk. Sometimes I go walk in three or four times a day, and that's normally where I've got a lot of pressure on at work. And it'll go, I'll do work, and it'll go, oh, right, laptop down, out, walk. Even if it's ten minutes, change my, I change my environment, I change the activity that I'm doing, and then what that does is it changes what the fucking brain is thinking. And you come back in, complete reset. And the, my most productive times are after, are during, and after I run, during and after. Yeah, I my best thoughts come when I'm running. They do. They do. <laughs> they, they do. Yeah. Best decisions. That could be a decision not to do some fucking airbrain thing I decided to do it. But it can also, I often get answers to big problems or or decisions that I want to make either in life or with the podcast or with work. They come when I'm running. And it's because, I, and no headphones in, no nothing. It's me and the ground and my fucking feet pounding it. And you completely focus switching the brain off on everything and you've not given yourself the choice but to think about whatever's in your mind try people who are out running try doing it without headphones in because everyone runs with fucking headphones in now go out and do it with nothing especially if you're stressed go and, and do it with nothing and, and not running to a time just running like so not staring at your what you know some people were like and i get i get it if you're um running for yeah. performance benefits yeah. you know you're trying to do an event in a certain time but if you're trying to run for looking after you then I find that again with that, I guess diversity of thought, that I have some of those really interesting tangents that my mind goes on and discover different components, and um, is is when I'm running again, and I, I really enjoy running at night. Um, actually, like under the ambient moonlight. Um, I don't um, sleep if I do. If I go running at night, if I go running after about five o'clock, I, I ain't sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, so I <laughs> recently found that out. I did that. Um, as, as you know, I did that. Oh, uh, you did the Goggins challenge, yeah, yeah. mate. How was that? It was well. I didn't sleep after after doing <laughs> the run. <laughs> so I got up at you know twelve, twelve, go for a run, come back, wide awake until almost three o'clock. Just just get off to sleep, and it's time to wake up again. Um, I'm but gonna... but re- really in like really interesting thought process. Apart from when a deer jumped out. Scared the shit out of me <laughs> running along, um, but no, that is all right. But uh, that that was um, that was mainly about holding my. I, I didn't want to do that for a charity fundraiser or anything else. So I just wanted to do that for me, and I only found out about it a week or so before. And um, I thought, yeah, I, I'll, I'll have a crack at that. Um, and I, I think like my outlook on things can, like, just yeah, I'll have a crack at that. Not going, oh, could I do it? And. I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but there's not many things that I don't think I can do. Not that I think I can do everything, because I definitely can't, but I think if somebody wants to do something, they can make it happen, but it's going to take a lot of hard work to get there. In, and I think that's just a good aspect to live by. Um, but you know, it's figuring out what you want to do and then how much you want to sacrifice for that and other components. But um, for me, doing that... Uh, Goggins challenge uh, the, so that's run four miles every four hours for 48 hours um, and I do quite a bit of running anyway so the running aspect wasn't that difficult um, and I was just just cruising um, just going out and you know w- wasn't running for a certain time or anything else just go out and get it done just holding myself to account 
and that's what it was for me. So, just yeah, that that self accountability, and I haven't had to do that for quite a while in that aspect of. Like I said to you before about it being similar to a stag shift where you're the only person on stag, <laughs> but the only person you're jacking on is yourself. No one's gonna, you know, no one else is out in the wet and cold, and you've got that external motivator to be like, right, I need to look after my buddy. I need to get him off stag. Although I definitely don't want to get on my little scratcher. You know, it's like it's, you're getting out of bed. It was like I only, I'm only gonna be letting myself down. Um, but then having a balanced approach with that as well, and not to not to beat yourself up either um, and be yeah. really hard on yourself and that's one area that I sort of uh, it's about achievements isn't it and pe- it's hard for people to snap out of that uh, to, to, to snap out of that um, that sort of trough you can get into where you it's hard to motivate yourself to do anything and some people are that generous generally and other people like it because they've had a degradation of mental health like I, I got in a position couldn't motivate myself well that's one of the problems, as you full well know, when you get to the bottom of that pit, there is no motivation to do anything. No motivation exists anymore. Yeah. But one of the ways you can sort of get yourself out of that is you're talking about achievements, mate. It's 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 uh, it's to achieve, and so you don't have to set yourself a grant. Like you don't have to set yourself, an achievement is an achieving things is another way to elevate yourself. And that, and it's got to be personal to you as well. So. Like if someone goes out and you know smashes a marathon, you know good for them. But if someone goes out and, and I, I'm just focused on running here, but then they they did a 5k, that like, I think that's pretty confident. That there's, well, there, there are studies that have gone in to say you know somebody who's um, achieved something at Olympic level versus that person who's completed it at um, um, you know amateur level, you know, and they've set they they set themselves to. Um, to achieve that 5k in under whatever time or even if it is just to do you know the couch 5k the reward mentally is the same yeah and so so it's, to, it's, it's all got to be personal and um so the way yeah. to the way to judge it you're absolutely right ask the person itself and the way and the way the way to judge that is look again maybe someone out there maybe people out there who like they haven't done any physical activity for god knows how long right so they're thinking 5k fucking hell they haven't done anything of, of any hardship god knows how long they, but they want to but they can't motivate themselves themselves to do it. They, they want to do it, but they they can't motivate, motivate themselves to do it. They don't think they can do it. So exactly as you were saying, mate, you make it relevant to yourself. Achievement relative relative to you. Stuff everyone else. And the easy way to try and g- g- set yourself a first task is the, the aim is to put yourself out of your comfort zone. That's all you're going to do. Put yourself out of your comfort zone. I went through a stage of doing this every day. Um... Uh, Early on, when my brain, when my mind was in a bit of a better place, and I was, I was trying lots of different things, and I decided every day I was going to do something to put myself out of my comfort zone. And for example, like I would try and choose physical activity stuff and stuff that was crap at. Uh, the plank, I hate the plank. I hate the plank. And I used to say to myself, I'm going to get up in the morning, and I'm going to do the plank for four minutes. I couldn't do the plank for 30 seconds, right? But I would go down and I would, that's it. That was my, that was all I had to achieve was the plank for four minutes. If I took 30 breaks, if I spent most of it on my knees and it took me 20 minutes to do four minutes of a plank and so many rest I was doing, it was regardless because what I was doing was, one, I was doing the plank that I hated and two, I achieved four minutes of it. Yeah, it took me like half an hour because my old man back. But, Outside of my comfort zone, fuck everyone else. If I went and said to someone, "Oh, I achieved, I did four minutes of the plank this morning," yeah, well, yeah great, you, you loser. But I achieved something, and then that all builds up because the next time you set yourself a task, you set yourself something a little harder because you've got confidence in yourself, and you know you'll get off the couch to go and do it because you did it yesterday. But that, that's that volu- I think there's that voluntary choice to go off and do that. Um, you know, in that example, the plank, and that you're volunteering to do that, opposed to being made to do it. And I think when you voluntarily to do volunt voluntarily do something where you put yourself through discomfort that you can grow the most and I genuinely believe in that but you know if someone made you get down you know and do the plank you'd be like this is, it'd be hugely understandable that you're like nah not doing that again but the fact that you've done it you know you, you own it and you're proud of it and that's come back to something I think which I don't which I think can be hugely related to trauma and take it you know bring this back full circle if you get that um, civvy off the street and then put them, drop them in the middle of a contact and then they're in that ditch where, you know, rounds are flying all over the place. You know, they, they didn't choose to be there. They haven't made that, uh, those choices to get there. And, you know, it's 
a completely alien environment where you've got that soldier who's then he's actively chose to do it. You know, he, you know, no one made him join the army. You know, it's not a conscript. You know, he he's volunteered to do that. Um, he's emotionally invested throughout all the. Or she, but they are emotionally invested within their within within their. Um, I know why he did that. <laughs> um, emotionally invested to get to wh where where they are, and you know th those ex experiences at that point. My point was about being um, voluntarily exposing yourself to hardship or overcome hardship and you'll grow much more. Where if you're put into hardship, it can be hugely crippling and be um, detrimental to your health. Where if you do it voluntarily, often it can be produce growth. So you can do the same event, but different aspects of going into it. One will bring you know, growth, the other one will bring distress or suffering mm -hmm. right on right that's a good 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 time to bring it to a close i think anything anything we did, did didn't cover what did you want to cover i spoke about reacting in any aspect go on then all right um yeah so joined up as a <laughs> <laughs> sorry stefan <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the reasons why you want to make one of you continue on <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so join react within uh 20 2017 i think and it was uh, again bags that posted it online um, so went down to the open day, um, and I was brought into it straight away. Um, Hurricane Irma and Maria happened in, um, 2018. So I went out to the response for that. And th uh, then team Rubicon is very different, different to what it is now. Um, and it, it, it was, that was an interesting, um, trip and, I think the organization was learning a lot as well around about itself. So there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, and then I went on to, um, but re really enjoyed, um, enjoyed is probably a, a difficult word, but then going on to um, have a much more involvement with React um, and then responding to the floods in Birmingham. Um, that, and that was probably surprisingly one of the most rewarding things that I've done which might be quite surprising from the other aspects that, um, of things. I think that's just because of the simplicity of it, being able to digest what happened, that you went there on the day, you know, you, you help, helped people um, who have just had their lives turned upside down, their houses have been flooded, you've cleared out all the, all the you know, once the flood waters uh, rec uh, receded, you've then cleared out all the damaged, um, um, you've created them a new blank canvas. So... It's and it's essentially it's turned their per that person's life upside down, and then you've gone in there and cleared them a, a new start in place. And someone, you know, who, you know, to them a stranger who's just come in, and with them, you know, accepting that help, has then hugely impacted their their day, um, and means to be able to get on because they don't feel so alone as well. So it's not just the physically of what you're doing; it's how that's impacting that person as well. So then, um, so I'm going to go, because you say about time. Oh, you're right, cool. Let me just um, sort this mic up, because you fucked it up. Just the cable. There you go. Cool. And then, um, so yeah, I had, had quite a bit of involvement with React then since, um, helping out with different training, um, training packages and other components. And then um, Cyclone EDI happened. So then I was one of the um, group of the first people that went out. So just after Paul and um, Lizzie Starman went out for the recce, they then a uh, call for arms for people to then go out as part of that first wave response there. And then that was that was a really interesting um, experience going out to Mozambique because they're just really complex. And they're not very hugely rewarding afterwards doing the doing the deployment but not um by no means a holiday and i think that that's one thing that i've um, reflected on um doing part of the training afterwards that you know you can you can see the pictures and the and you see the stats and you think oh wow you know that's awesome you know it looks really cool and it's almost quite sexy doing this uh, international deployments and they're really difficult but hugely rewarding and then you know that sort of ties into that you know that reward that you get from doing 
you know, overcoming those difficult challenges because especially those early responses that it's a puzzle that you've got hardly any of the pieces for and you've got to try and create that picture. So when we got into country, um, you know, you, you've got to navigate a lot of those different aspects. So for me, um, and initially with three teams, then split it down to two. And then um, I know later on you went up to Matarara and then I was down in the South Fuzi. And um, so I'd spent a few days in Bera um, with one of the other blokes and we helped sort out um, a new water system essentially for World Central Kitchen to be able to wash and clean um, with clean water um, to be able to provide meals for all the IDP camps, which I think served 14,000 people a day or 14,000 meals f feeding 7,000 people. Um, and then spent a, a short amount of time in the emergency operations center and then went out to meet the one of the other strike teams um, almost as a bit of a Sherpa. So had my, had my burger full of about 40, well, it was 40 kilos of food um, and just went half routine on that. And then um, got a helicopter, me, me and one of the other people. And um, so got off, it was basically a Puma, but it belonged to the South African Army. And they, they just dropped us off. Um, and after I went off to speak to the pilot and I said, you know, here's a Latin long, this is where I want to go to. He dropped, you know, did his little conversion, dropped me off at said grid. And um, I remember getting off the helo and then, the other person that I was with, you know, watched a healer go off and uh, just looked at me um, like quite, you know, you know, this is real now. You know, we're out in the ground, we're out in the African bush and we're off. And I've got like a little sketch map of, you know, on the back of a back of a notepad of my interpretation of the ground. I've got a compass and a bit of a bearing, so I write, you know, we're going that way. And it's quite interesting afterwards talking to that person, they've, they've said about it quite openly that, and this is a re retired um, a retired detective who then turned around and said that was the most loneliest he'd ever felt in his life, watching that helo take off, where at the same time, I was there going, right, I'm absolutely buzzing. You know, I know where I'm, you know, I've got, got a bear and I know where I'm going. And um, so anyway, we ended up, you know, navigating, um, you know, a few little obstacles, irrigation ditches and other components, then found the rest of the team. And um, from there, we... Um, most of the half the team then focused on getting a disused runway reopened, um, and, and then me and another part of the team then focused on getting a logistics fob, um, which was at the location of a former Soviet sugar plantation that hadn't been used since the collapse of communism. So it needed a bit of tidying up and work, and then we worked with the local people um, in that area to then make that happen. And then the rest of my time was then spent out in the back of a pickup truck, identifying where people were or where people were where the villagers weren't anymore where people were then being relo um have self relocated to how many um fatalities that they had within their community how many cases of cholera what they're doing with those what their sanitation was like their basic you know their basic needs and um painting that situational awareness Identif identifying the um which roads routes were transitable and which routes weren't um because of a lot of the flood water receded, but some of the routes weren't uh, transitable. Um, like bridges collapsed or just just mud, um, where even tractors were getting stuck. Um, so you you know you wouldn't be able to get aid down down those routes. And then um, there, was, there was quite a lot of difficult components to that as well because you're working with other NGOs, and that's one of the key things that and I really like about working or having done work, work with React that you're there going off and doing work for the good and it's not and I, I think that's where that military approach does come in um and i don't think you've got to be military in any aspect and that that's evident through through the experiences i've had as well but being able to fully commit to what it is that you're doing and there was no case of all right yeah well we've done our work for the day we'll we'll just chill out it's we are we're in this. People have just, you know, even if they're away for two weeks, they'll throw themselves at that two weeks and they will graft in all aspects. And it is really difficult, these um, international deployments, because you don't know all the aspects. Um, but And you're, un you're unpicking things all the time. And, you know, you're a new team that's just formed, but you really grow as well. And there's, we're all human. We've all got 
different complexities um but finding the right people that then pull together and complement each other is massive and that's one of the great things about it not being um exclusively ex-military which i don't think would be quite um quite sad as well in terms of the amount of output that they'd be able to produce um so anyway um staying with mozambique that they I think initially they thought there were 40,000 people and they said that this area was unreachable, um, the the district of um, Booty South. And um, this, this was right at the beginning of the emergency operations centre and it was, you know, a really unfortunate case of, right, we, we don't think we can, you know, help keep these people alive, but we can focus on keeping these people alive over here in the cities and in these other places in Matawara and wherever there were other areas. And um, it was one, one of the other uh, people react in the um, emergency operations centre at the time. It was like, cool we'll go there we'll, we'll take that on like you say that place is unreachable we'll go there went out they um, flew along in a helicopter did a you know a little route recce and then went right we identified an area then pe more people went in um and a very so there's a team of six and what ultimately what we did there and this wasn't you know didn't really realize this until a couple of months after the operation that you could then put all the other parts of the pieces together, parts of the puzzle together to be able to understand that full picture. But where they thought there was 40,000 people who were unreachable, we were able to identify 64,000 people and be able to pr produce a gateway for A to be able to get into them and reach those people, which is massive because you know, a lot of those people I don't think if it wasn't for the actions of, I think there would have been a lot more people who would have died um, as a result of that, um, the the events of the cyclone, if it wasn't for the actions that was taken by those other people. And there was, you know, and that's full selfless commitment there. No one's there being paid, but they're, they're grafting and the outputs are massive um, of what they're achieving. Um, I'm conscious on time. We all right? Okay. Cool. Um, so, and, you know, at the same time as well, um, lo lots of, lo yes, there are lots of hardships, but there's lots of brilliant moments as well. And throughout these, these different experiences that I've been able to be fortunate enough to have or react. And one of them, it was just one of the most simplest of things. And it was, you know, I think this might have even been the day or the day after, um, going out to a, a village um, to be able to, gain that situational awareness of their needs to be able to get them that aid um, was a, a a cow was pulling a cart of people um, that were unwell we went into this village spoke to the village um, the village mayor found out what you know what their needs were and you know um, had a look around as well um, to be able to identify those and as we were coming back the cart was on its way back and all the people that um, I think had cholera, and they'd all died on the way to the next next village. Um, you know, and it was, you know, it is really powerful going out on these different experiences. But then I think it was probably the day after or two days later where we were, I say where we were, yeah, where we were staying, um, which was you know, essentially just out in the bush. Um, on the on the side of a village, there was these young little girls, and I, I, was, I remember I walked to the well to get um, to get the water and brought it back to purify. And there were these little girls walking back with the water um, in the little buckets in their head, and they're singing along. And it was one of life's absolute joys because they, they were just laughing at me because you know I looked very different, and you know they're, they're singing along, and I, I I could never do it enough justice by trying to communicate into words that feeling of wow you know it was just one of life's little joys because there's so much suffering that was going on so you know you go into these these communities and mass parts of these communities are now dead and then you've got these these little girls and they're probably five who you know in the face of all of this adversity were just still being able to sing along and just just a real beautiful moment in life. Um, 
and yeah like so the the experiences i think that i've been able to have with react have been massive um and positive um in in so many different ways you know not just within me um but you know for for the people the survivors of that country but also within me as well um and I won't want to just coin it as the you know sense of belonging because it's so much more, but being able to buy into something and give that selfless commitment voluntarily, you know, going through that hardship to overcome all these difficult barriers, which every disaster is different. They're never going to be the same. You can, you know, you can learn as much about this as you want, but every, Every time it's going to be a different picture of that puzzle. If you can stay, if I'll, if I'll stay with that analogy, so you don't know what that picture is going to look like, but you still got to unpick it, and you still, you'll, you'll have a um, a method of being able to make that um, picture to what it is. But I think the the act, and I'm really not explaining this very well, but the the actions that have be, absolutely awesome experiences essentially through through those um through those different deployments and then bringing that into um the bahamas a couple of months later um and using that same model of the small teams being able to deploy out and be the eyes and ears and get out and do that do that full work um is massive um where that, that you know that's been tried tried and tested now that model and the different diver the diversity of the team as well. And I remember going out to the Bahamas, um, and I went out to Grand Bahama. So most of the people um, went down to Abaco, one of the other islands, and then I was up on Grand Bahama. And there was uh, Ellie Naval Commander, I think, I think it's Commander, like Lieutenant Colonel, but Ellie, a retired detective from the police, um, a myself um and then somebody worked at wallace and gromit as a puppet maker you know <laughs> and you know, you know <laughs> but that person me and that me and them teamed up and we really complemented each other's skills so i think that diversity of those different teams had a much massive output so i think without that being you know, um, just focusing on that military component, having that diversity of that team, but having that common focus to be able to be driven, selfless, that selfless commitment, take those additional calculated risks um, is is huge. Um, and what can be done by those small agile teams, the output is massive. Um, and again, being, being the... Um, being some of the, you know, being those eyes and ears and being tenacious to get out to, like, the east of the island. Um, I think tenacious is the right word because there's a lot of politics and complexity going on in these uh, natural disasters. And everyone's a survivor, even the person who was running the emergency operation centre, um, who was a part of the government. His sister and her family had been killed as a part of the... the um, the hurricane that had come through and then getting out to the east of the island and like I said, being tenacious to get out there. We were, you know, some of the first people to meet some of the survivors with, you know, palatable water. And this is almost after, um, I think probably five, six days. So, um, you know, flashbang, um, of Paul and Lizzie getting out was pretty quick. And then on the tail end of that, I think we were rallied up within, flying out within 48 hours then straight out onto the ground almost hit the ground running um you know new form team you've got to um work through all of that as well and bond and gel and everyone's human but finding out how to work work to be able to get the best out of everyone in such a short period of time but then being able to get out and then help these people where through that tenacity again 
yeah, I, I, I'd stay, say, and I, was, I don't know why I was reluctant to say it, but lives were saved. And, you know, help sustained as well as a result. Um, and then on the, on the back end of those, because um, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to be out in those earlier parts, but with being able to let, unlock those roots, if you like, to be able to provide aid to those people and then get the other working alongside all the other organizations. And I think that's one of the massive parts of it as well. And then, um, you know, opposed to it being like, um, to use a description of like the Team America, of like we get there, we put the flag in. You know, it's none of that. It is turning up, being good people, working with other good people to a common goal to help relieve human suffering is massive. Really haven't done much uh, justice. No, no, no. I agree. We do need to start wrapping up. I uh, no, I agree. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm. I'm I discovered the organisation about a, you know, probably a year later than you, and uh, I've had the same experiences, mate. Um, it, the, as in positive experiences, and positive experiences in helping people in suffering. And that's not like a flipping, you know, flipping saviour thing. It's just a case of there is an the organisation has as as a capability to help people. I am part of the organisation, you are part of the organisation, and so we're going to help people. And that is rewarding. That's rewarding personally. That's rewarding, uh, and that's and, and that. It's rewarding to the organisation, and it's of benefit to everyone. And and like just to highlight, I mean, we talk, you know, they, we talk about international disaster response. There, last last year and a half, pan, the, the react disaster responses support to the the COVID response here in the UK, unbelievable. And in as in as diverse a way, you know, I've gone from, you know, I've done tasks like shifting, shifting. Um, like short notice tasks, like next day stuff, shifting a whole, a whole, uh, the whole, all the contents of a hospital ward, everything from the beds to the flipping bedpans to the to the to the, the cabinets and the shelves and the and other stuff, shifting it from one ward to another county in another ward because that other county has got a massive uptick in COVID cases in the particular area. They more they more they more bed space done stuff like that. Then there's, I know I think you've done out you've run COVID vac- vaccination centers other people have gone and and be and they've worked in fucking mortuaries they've gone and you know dealing with the dead because the mortuaries have been overrun with with unfortunate the unfortunate souls have been victim of of uh of not just covid but other illnesses and ailments that have that you know, that have uh that have um caused more casualties than we normally do because because of the energy has been stressed and then also uh going into Care homes are onto not care homes, but onto wards where there are people who are sick and suffering, and they need just basic things like shifting the people in the bed position because there's not enough nurses. So you get you get a react disaster responder in there, and their job is literally up close and personal with people who who are really suffering from the the uh, the virus, and they're just there to provide the most basic of support. It doesn't need nursing qualifications. It just needs someone who is willing to go and do it, willing to go and do it, volunteering, like you said, and especially in the UK, you put putting themselves at risk. I've only done one task doing it. I wish you had done more. There are people, and I know you have done loads and loads of tasks doing it. But it's, you know, they're amazing people are part of the organisation, and there are other organisations as well that are doing amazing stuff. But the fact of the matter is, I'm part of React and React. From what I've seen, being overseas and you in the UK, they're, just, they're, they're a different breed. There's something different. They're, they're a different breed. There's something different about it. Yes, it's predominantly ex-military in it, but you made an interesting point earlier. It's not. You don't have to be ex-military to be there. It's the it's the military. It's the military way in which they go about things. That is positive. That is that is what makes them different. You don't. Have, you can be a civilian to be part of. It. You can be a civilian. And do that and, and achieve those things. And, and there are times over the last year and a half where that has been an option to go and volunteer with them. Uh, but we didn't close it up. But so React Disaster Response is what you're talking about. And what's the website? re actorguk just search. There's only one React. React Disaster Response is what Stefan's talking about. Um, take a look. It's fucking unbelievable. And they are grafting right now and they've been grafting since early on last year. Um, yeah, what else? Just tie it up with how this comes full circle, but sense of community and, and that through React as well. How I mean, that's how we met. Um, uh, also how I found out about the podcast. And then whilst I was um, 
at one of the one of the tasks that was on this year's the vaccination site, and then was chatting to one of the people, um, and they were like, "Oh yeah, I found out about this through this podcast." Um, is there again that I come full circle? I've heard that a few times now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where did you meet Mike? No, no. Again, just through this. Oh, you did through this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but um, shout out to Mikey Valance. <laughs> the the yeah, I, I think it's an absolutely organ- awesome organisation, and the. That for me, there's been massive benefits of being or doing the volunteering with with React, and it's not just the um, the actual deployments and the experiences on those deployments, but it's also that community as well. And surround yourself by like minded, decent people, and it does rub off as well. That you you there will be growth through yeah hanging around with good people, and you you bounce off one another and radiate. And that, for me, that was one of my, one of the, I guess, linchpins, holding, keeping me, keeping me alive, actually, hold, holding me on. Um, and yeah, that, I'd say that sense of community that comes with, not just React, but like volunteering in general, I think people should, um, if they, if they've got the opportunity to be able to give that selflessness to an aspect of volunteering can be hugely powerful. It doesn't it doesn't have to be reacting. You know, I wouldn't say shameless plug because it's it's not at all. It's helping it's helping people. Um, but yeah, volunteering can be hugely beneficial. Mm-hmm. I agree, hundred percent, mate. Uh, been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, what are we on you? Two hours, two hours, six minutes. Yeah. I went quick. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> um, any, anything shout out or any plugs or anything? So we've mentioned React Disaster Response. What have we, what have any, anything else you want to mention or not? Not off the top of my head. Okay. There's loads of awesome stuff out there, but yeah. Yeah, nothing off the top of my head. Might have enjoyed it. Cheers, mate. Thanks for coming up. <laughs>